Hi, everyone. Good morning. Happy Saturday. My name is Jen with Slope Garden Center. I'm just going to talk a bit while people are filing in. Um, really excited for today's class with Suzanne Bontempo. We have her back again. She's amazing. Um, and it's on identifying beneficial insects. Um, this is really important to be mindful of as we're going through the spring season and really encouraging and creating a community or army of beneficial insects that can really impact the overall health of our garden. So really happy, happy to learn with her today. Um, you all should have gotten a link to her outline and several resource handouts. And that was sent with the reminder email that you got about an hour ago. Um, so a lot of good information there. And uh, as always, the recording will be available the two, this next Tuesday after the class. So it should be available April 20th. And that's really helpful because you can go back and rewind and fast forward and screenshot and whatnot. And so that's a really valuable resource for information. Um, I do want to take a moment and ask you all, I know several of you have been on multiple webinars of ours, and I really appreciate your feedback. And honestly, your feedback has really contributed significantly to the overall success of what we're doing. And so I'd ask if you could, um, I have a poll going on and I really want to, I want to explain one of the questions. I'm trying to figure out what to do for the summer webinar series. And I'm kind of, you know, I'm feeling like we're all going to be vaccinated and, you know, want to be out traveling, traveling and be outdoors. I'm not sure how appealing um, sitting and doing a webinar is going to be. So I'm, I'm trying to think of some fun classes. And an idea that I've come up with is sort of a garden appreciation series. I already start starting it off. Um, I have a local bartender that's going to show how to create summer garden cocktails. Um, I have a local photographer that's going to give us tips on garden photography um, with using your smartphone. And I'm going to book a local chef. And I'm really interested if you feel like that would be something intriguing to you. Um, or if you'd rather me just stick to like garden basics and garden care and whatnot. So this is all, like I said, I really appreciate any feedback that you can give on that. Um, and then also sort of like from that point, trying to figure out what's the best day, because again, maybe we'll be traveling and stuff on the weekends. I'm kind of feeling like maybe Wednesday evening would be best to, to do that sort of class. And so just let me know that's all in the poll. And I really appreciate your feedback. Um, okay. I'm going to stop talking now because Suzanne has a ton of information to show, to share. And I'm really happy to have her back again. Thanks so much, Suzanne. I look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Jen. Should we give folks another minute to do the poll or did you have enough information? Are you good? I can check. We can look because you did have a question on. Oh, yeah. What was, has anyone answered number seven? Okay. Um, most people um, are interested in bees and ladybugs um, specifically, but overall just all, all the above in terms of beneficial insects. So 67% are interested in all of the above and 46% in bees, 51% in ladybugs. Um, and then again, Contra Costa County just represents every, uh, webinar. So there's what? 30, 39% are from fantastic. Contra Costa County. And then we have 27% in SF and 22% in Marin. Great. Thank, thank you all for filling out the poll. Really appreciate it. I 
I'm trying to figure out how I can remove the poll from my screen so I can start going. Oh, and I didn't mention if any questions oh, that you have drop into the, the Q and a, mm -hmm. um, and we'll, Suzanne might address some of them during her presentation, but we're going to reserve the majority of them towards the, for the end of the presentation. So mm -hmm. I'll kind of filter through those and then um, we'll go through them at the end. Okay, super. All right. Well, thanks, Jen. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we are going to talk about identifying beneficial insects in our garden, which is one of the funnest things I think uh, to learn about. So I'm very excited to be here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to go through slides for a good solid 45 minutes, possibly even 50 minutes. There's a lot of good content I really want to share with you today. And then as Jen just mentioned, we're going to save time afterwards for questions. And what we're going to learn about is who many of the common good bugs are that we will find in our gardens and then how they're helping us and how to keep them around. So it's pretty simple, but uh, not always so easy to see. So as the program manager of Our Water, Our World, I'd just like to share, I always have to give Our Water, Our World a little shout out, that we are a program that uh, was designed to bring awareness between pesticides and water quality. And we partner with agencies, the water pollution prevention agencies, and the retailers to get this really good information out to you. So you might recognize our, pro, our materials in your local garden center or hardware store. These are uh, a rack of fact sheets, the picture on the left. These are fact sheets that are for you to take and to reference. You can also find them on the website. They address uh, pest problem solving for sustainable results. So you'll see different topics like spiders and rats and mice and aphids and ants. So have a look at those. And then you might also notice our little blue tags. These are our shelf talkers that we put underneath to identify uh, the products, to identify which products are going to be less toxic and eco-friendly, safer for your environment, your family, your children and your pets. And more importantly, uh, they do not, uh, uh, in, in, they're not toxic to our waterways. So just know when you see these little tags underneath the products that these are going to be safer choices for you. And since Our Water, Our World is an integrated pest management educational program, I always like to start by just reminding everyone what IPM or introducing you to what IPM is, because it's, um, you know, not all, you know, not a common thing we hear about all the time. So integrated pest management or IPM is a decision making process based on science based solutions. So it allows us to look at the system as a whole. In this case, we're going to be talking about our gardens and it helps us identify what the problem is. And then from there, we learn about uh, what's causing that problem. And then we um, understand if it's a problem that we can live with, or is it a problem that we can just know it's going to take care of itself and get resolved shortly. If action is needed, then we use a combination of actions, which are going to be the cultural controls, increasing the health of the garden or the environment, mechanical controls, which are the tools we use to manage pests, such as traps and barriers, biological controls using living organisms to manage pests, and in today's class, beneficial insects, and then the chemical controls are the pesticides that we always use as a last resort and only when needed. So IPM for beneficial insects, it's going to be primarily identification. Identification is the key. We wanna be able to identify the good bugs and the bad bugs, because if we can't, then things are going to get a little um, challenging for us. We're going to set our gardens up for success. We're gonna grow biodiversity and we're going to reduce and eliminate pesticide usage. So first, I'm gonna test your knowledge. So I'd just like everyone to take a minute to find the raised hand feature, the raised hand feature or the thumbs up feature or thumbs down feature. Does everybody and everyone practice and say they found it with a thumbs up or a raised hand? We're doing a practice run. And Jen, maybe if you can help folks navigate that. I forgot to- um, Yeah, I would- 
I was just going to say, I see 30 people raising their hands. I'm not sure if you see that. 30, I don't. 40, 40 people. Okay, great. Okay, so Jen, I'm going to need you through this one. It's short. It's fun. So let's get started. I don't know if I can see exactly who is raising their hand. I just oh, no, I just, let's just get uh, uh, how, like, do you could just say thumbs? Yes, yes, no, no, yes, no. Or, you know, hands up. It means yes. Yeah, All I right. just see the raised hand because I can't see thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, so if, okay. Okay. All right, so this is going to be a fun learning experience for all of us. So we see this in the garden. It looks really freaky. Are we going to squish it or not squish? If we're going to squish it, let's raise our hands. All right, everybody, are we squishing this one? We got any raised hands, Jen? Uh, 16 so far. Okay, kind of, I, it's freaky looking, right? Are we squishing it? All right. Give everyone another minute. 15 people said to squish. All right. Okay. That's pretty good. All right. Now this one. Oh my gosh. This one is so weird. Are we squishing this or are we not squishing it? Are we squishing it? How many people say yes, we squish it? Uh, 31 so far. All right. Oh my gosh. I know it's so weird. Bugs are so weird. <laughs> Okay. Ooh, we see this one in the garden. Are we squishing it? Or are we not squishing it? How many people say squish it? It just. Uh, 34. 34. Oh my gosh. All right. Oh, I can't even look. Uh, how many? Okay. You see this in the garden. Like this an one, alien. Yeah. It looks like an alien. How many are going to squish this one? Um, 25, 25. Yeah. Okay. Well, guess what? They were all beneficial insects. <laughs> Isn't that awesome. great? Awesome. All right. So let's meet our friends. All right. You can, uh, chime in by typing this in the chat or the Q and a, or we could just sit back and watch, but we all know who this one is, right? This is the star of the show in the garden. This is our lady beetle or ladybug. There's over 450 species of lady beetles in North America. They are going to range in a variety of colors as well as a pattern of spots. Uh, they are going to be predators of soft bodied insects such as aphids, uh, mealybugs, uh, scale insects, white fly nymphs, but uh, what we know them primarily as are aphid eaters. And both of the adults and the larvae are going to be enjoying those delicious protein meals by consuming a lot of pest insects such as aphids. The lady beetles can consume over 5 thousand of these pests throughout their lifespan and they can live anywhere from three months to a couple of years depending on the time of year that they actually emerge or were born. Um, the thing is is that the ladybugs need food to stick around so if you don't have ladybugs in your garden uh, and you are really quick to eliminate any pests then that might be the reason. So if we want the lady beetles to stick around, we want to have some populations of aphids as well, because once they've consumed all the aphids or other pests and there's no pests available, they're gonna fly possibly to another garden looking for another plant infested with aphids. What I can share is that uh, it's been documented that ladybugs or lady beetles, they love buckwheat. I'm not exactly sure why, but it's documented if you plant a perimeter of buckwheat around your property, it is unlikely or less likely for them to migrate past that. However, it's not just buckwheat that they like. Uh, they really love a diversity of flowers as well as trees and shrubs, uh, but primarily, you know, they wanna have a diversity of all of these garden plants. 
we want to include chunky bark around the garden as well as small branches or limbs that maybe we trimmed off of a tree or a shrub we can lay them down possibly to line a walkway or maybe as kind of decorative near some other shrubs and the reason why is they like to nest and rest in like the chunky bark or in the limbs of these branches all right all right so remember this one this is our ladybug larva. This is our teenager of the ladybug, I like to call them. They look like little tiny alligators. Uh, they do look really freaky and they do range in some, you know, sizes of about a quarter of an inch to maybe about a half an inch. They are tiny. They are also going to uh, vary in colors. So similar to the adults, uh, they will have different coloring. So they either come, um, I've seen them as all black, or black with gray, black with orange, black with red. And that coloring, that gray, red, or orange can either be striping or splotchy kind of dots like you see here. They will feed for a couple of weeks uh, on the insects. So they're going to stay in this farm for a few weeks, two to four weeks or so. And just their primary goal is just to eat other insects. They do a really great job. They can consume hundreds during this stage of their life. And uh, they really love aphids, soft scale, spider mites, and other insect eggs. And has anyone seen this in the garden? This looks really weird. This is the lady beetle pupa. So this will, the lady beetle uh, from the larval form, that teenager, will then pupate into this little uh, dome shape. I just saw one on the side of my raised bed. I got very excited, but oftentimes I see them on leaves through, you know, among plants. They will be in this stage from a few days up to a couple of weeks. So you can notice him out there. And then this, if you've seen these, I have hundreds of these around my garden right now, which makes me very happy. These are the lady beetle eggs. So the eggs look like uh, golden yellow little football footballs up on their point. And um, the adult females can lay, you know, more than a thousand throughout the spring and summer months. They are typically in clusters of five to 30 and they will these eggs uh, will be there for a few days until the larva will hatch. So anywhere from two to six days, we'll see the larva. So it's really fun when we see the eggs, but check under the leaves before you trim your plants because I sadly just accidentally trimmed some off. All right, who's this friend? This is our green lacewing. The green lacewings, uh, we might recognize them from fluttering around the porch light at night. Uh, we also see them fluttering around our flower gardens. They feed on pollen and nectar, and they also feed on the honeydew uh, secretions that the aphids create, as well as other soft-bodied insects. And depending on the weather and the season, they can live anywhere from four to six weeks. And this weird looking little insect, it's very tiny, it's the lacewing larva. Now, this little predator, who is uh, very good at eliminating a lot of pests, is very, very tiny. In fact, the first time I ever saw it in person was about four years ago. And though it's very tiny, anywhere from a 32nd of an inch, inch I'm sorry, three eighths of an inch to a half an inch, though it's very tiny, you do recognize it. It is very recognizable because of those uh, piercing mouth parts and those spines. So here's the thing. They love to eat food. In fact, they have such uh, uh, a strong appetite that they are nicknamed the aphid lion. They are going to uh, just just an extremely large carnivorous appetite. They are going to feast on aphids, thrips, mites, mealybugs, white fly nymphs, small caterpillars, insect eggs, and other soft-bodied insects. They will eat hundreds of these insects during this larval stage, which is just about two to three weeks. 
Um, the cool thing is, this is what I, years ago when I was preparing this program, I read um, uh, 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 some research from one of the universities that um, they were studying the ladybug larva and they found that the ladybug larva would go in and eat some aphids and then take the shells of the aphids that were left, throw them on their back to you know, get pierced onto those little spines as camouflage to go in to eat more aphids. Isn't that crazy? Oh my gosh, insects are really smart. All right, now this is really cool. These are lacewing eggs. And if any of you follow me on Instagram, you saw that yesterday I posted that I found some eggs on the back of my uh, arugula that I was about to put on my sandwich and in my salad. And good thing I was playing a very close look or I would have eaten them, but uh, very, very tiny. Now these littles are going to be very tiny and they are going to, uh, you'll see them on this little stalk that's about a quarter of an inch. And the egg itself, it's a, bit, a little less than a quarter of an inch. And the reason why they're on these little uh, stalks is because when they are born, those lacewing larvae have such big appetites that they would eat their, uh, the other eggs in that cluster if they were all on the ground together like those ladybug eggs. So the, they, the adults are smart. They know if they put them on these little stalks, then that um, larva will hatch, will climb down the stalk and then start immediately eating all of the pest insects. You'll notice these around um, aphid infestations. If you notice here, there's a lot of aphids. So this is kind of fun. All right, and here, this is a lady, uh, lacewing egg there featured around a whole cluster of um, ladybug larvae. So these are ladybug larvae that are particularly just all black. So sometimes we see them just all black. And here's the cool thing. If you feel that you don't have any of these insects, any of these good bugs in your garden, especially the ladybugs, because they're a little easier to see, before you reach for that pesticide, make a, a little concoction of one tablespoon of sugar into one cup of water and spray that on the plants. The sugary substance is going to attract lacewings and ladybugs, and that might be a good way to attract them to the garden before you reach for that pesticide. All right, here's one of my most favorites. I'm pretty sure this is my spirit insect friend. This is the surfid fly, otherwise known as the hoverfly. Now, this uh, little friend is oftentimes mistaken as a bee or a wasp, though he's a true fly, so he does not have a stinger, but he does have these beautiful stripes. They do not sting. They're a true fly. They are not going to try to swarm us. But what we do see um, them is they're going to uh, vary in size as very, very tiny to kind of like a medium small. And we see them darting around the garden, kind of like a helicopter. So they'll go and hover and then go to the side and hover. And they really love their flowers. And the most favorite flower that you can plant for them is alyssum. However, they absolutely love uh, other flowers uh, such as parsley, when we let our parsley go to flower or cilantro or dill, you'll see them swarming the cilantro, parsley and dill flowers. But they also love cosmos and yarrow. As you can see here, this little friend was posing for me. Um, buckwheat, cat mint, or nepeta, any plant that has a lot of tiny flowers, you're going to see the hoverflies out there. And they're doing a really good job pollinating flowers for us as they also eat the nectar. Now, this little strange thing that we all wanted to squish is the surfid fly larva. Totally weird, really cool. Now, this is a tiny little worm-like, and because it's coming from a fly, it's classified as a maggot, which is not a word we like to use, right? However, this is going to be little. We're going to see him as either 1 32nd of an inch up to about a half an inch. 
So that's like about a millimeter to about a half an inch. And they're going to range in color either from a limey leafy green or all the way to kind of a khaki to like a tan or a, a beige color. And that this one um, indicator is that they always have this racing stripe down their back. So as tiny as they are, you're always going to be able to identify the stripe down their back. And they love aphids. They'll eat other soft bodied insects, but their favorite is aphids. And if you go out and if you have a lot of roses and those roses get um, you know, attacked by a lot of aphids, especially this time of year, and when the temperatures get uh, just slightly warmer, we really see the aphid infestations coming on strong. Have a closer look and see if you can identify any of these little hoverfly larvae. They're really cool. They're very inconspicuous, but what we see, especially around dusk is when I go on my insect hunts, is they're on the stem and they're completely still. And then all of a sudden, snatch, they grab an aphid and gobble it up. It's a lot of fun. You see that little guy there? Do you recognize him? Here's another one here. So have a look next time you're outside in the garden for these little guys. And these are the eggs. The eggs are also going to be super tiny and they are typically going to be right next to the adults will lay the eggs next to aphids. And they're going to be like little tiny uh, kind of whitish gray, like look like mini grains of rice. And they are going to, um, again, be about a millimeter. And yeah. They are just going to be eggs for a couple of days and then they're going to emerge as that larva. And then the larva is going to be around for, their whole life cycle is two to four weeks. So very short, so it's a very short time. So I just wanted to point that out. All right, now remember this alien? It's a mealybug destroyer. So this is a trip. This one is a trip. They are completely just 100% wanting to consume mealybugs. And then their second favorite is soft scale. And when neither of these are around, they will branch out and eat aphids and other soft bodied insects, but they are determined to eat hundreds, hundreds of mealybugs. Now the adults are super tiny. They're just a 16th of an inch while the larva is going to be bigger, about twice the size coming in at about um, a half an inch. Wait, did I say 16th? A sixth. A sixth. That's why I have my notes. The adults are a sixth of an inch and the larva is about a half an inch, about twice the size. And they are very fast. They are on the move. They are hunting mealybugs. So um, the larva, again, they have their lifespans about two months. And during the time that the larva is around, which is uh, a number of weeks, they're eating uh, just strictly mealybugs and they move pretty fast. But here's the deal. Have a little bit of a closer look next time you see a mealybug infestation. And if you see a, a one that looks like a supersized mealybug, that's actually the mealybug destroyer. So sadly, because they look so much like mealybugs, oftentimes they get eliminated because we don't recognize them and we go for that pesticide because we know how horrible a mealybug infestation can be. So that's the reason why I like to um, invite you to have a closer look. They have learned to look like mealybugs so that they can sneak up on their prey and consume them. It's kind of fun. All righty, isn't it neat? All right, now this one's a weird one. So this is a family or a whole like realm of parasitic wasps. This is where they got the idea for that movie Aliens with Sigourney Weaver. So not sure if you've, when the last time you saw that movie, I have to say I recently watched it, it's scary. So parasitic wasps live a portion of their life inside another insect, kind of weird. And there are several hundred species of these wasps but do not be alarmed. They're very, very tiny. Typically we don't even notice them. We don't recognize them and they have no interest in bothering us. They will not swarm us. They will not sting us. They want nothing to do with us. Their whole purpose 
is to lay eggs in and or on a pest insect. And when those eggs hatch, those eggs consume, that larva consumes that insect. Let's have another look. So the picture on the right is a little dark, I know, but I was at a garden center. And uh, actually, to be honest, I was specifically at Sloat on Sloat Avenue years ago. And a customer came in with this. These are camellia leaves and was really freaked out and was talking to a staff member there and was like, whoa, what the heck is this? And then one of the managers recognized it and brought me over because they knew I'd be so cool, like into it because it's the coolest thing ever. These are aphid mummies. So the next time you have an aphid infestation, Take a closer look. Typically, we don't see this many. Typically, it's one or two on uh, among an aphid population. But um, what happens is, is that the parasitic wasp, which is minuscule, very, very tiny, because aphids are tiny, uh, lays the egg inside. That larva will um, hatch, eat the inside of the aphid, and then emerge by cutting a perfect circle and uh, of that aphid and leave. And what's left is just the shell of the aphid. And they're typically a little pale in color and you know they, they look you know bloated. So next time you see an aphid uh, population, take a closer look. If you've got any aphid mummies, do not go for the pesticide because these parasitic wasps, wasps are taking care of it for you. All right, this friend, we see in the gardens right now. One of the earliest to emerge, uh, although I've got ladybugs emerging pretty early as well. This is the soldier beetle. It's in the same family as fireflies, but it doesn't have that light producing organ. They're going to be a little larger, about half an inch. And we see the kind of, you know, moving through the garden. They will feed on pollen and nectar, but they will also feed on soft bodied insects that are pests such as aphids uh, without doing any harm to our plants. So it is not uncommon for me to hear uh, that someone proudly uh, you know, saw these all on the plum tree and um, was, you know, went for the neem or went for something to eliminate them because they're like, yeah, that pest was just curling all the leaves on my plum. And then I had to break it to them that these were actually eating the aphids that were curling all the leaves on their plum. So I know I have probably killed beneficial insects in the past as well when I did not know or you know recognize them. So we all do it. So there's no shame, there's no blame. But now I just like to share that these are our friends and their larva is going there. Uh, the females lay the eggs in the soil, the larva hatch, the larva will live in the soil, eating and preying on soil dwelling insects. That larva is um, a little larger than the adult and it looks uh, like one of those little alligator type larva, like the, la um, like the lacewing and the ladybug. However, highly unusual and highly unlikely we'd ever see it. But just know they're down there uh, working hard for us in the soil while the adult is up on the plants, pollinating, uh, feeding off the nectar and eating some um, pest insects. All right, and here is our dragonfly. And I like to give the dragonflies a little shout out. I feel like we forget about them so often and how important they are. But since we live here among the Bay Area and throughout so many parts of um, the state and the country, we have many areas that we'll see dragonflies because they live in marshy areas, ponds, lakes, and creeks. They lay their eggs. Um, their eggs are very, very tiny. The eggs are going to be like the size of the tip of a ballpoint pen. And the eggs either are scattered over waterways or they're tucked into vegetation that is there among the marsh or they're um, going to be in like muddy stream beds. So once the eggs hatch, uh, their larva of the um, dragonfly will stay in the water for a while, anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of years before they emerge as a dragonfly. The dragonfly during its uh, short lifespan of just uh, several weeks will fly around, uh, they will hunt, looking for flying insects to eat, uh, 
a three mile radius from their home, which is a pretty big span of space. During that time, they are looking for mosquitoes, fungus gnats, flies, and other small flying insects, and they can consume hundreds. But it's really important for us to understand that pesticides and other chemicals we use around the home can impair the waterways and actually can um, kill the larva. So that's um, one big reason why it's so important for us to, when we use a pesticide, to use a pesticide that is going to be eco-friendly and not impair water quality so that we can protect and encourage the dragonflies to do the important work they do. Um, I want to just do a side note that when we use products like the mosquito dunks and the mosquito bits, this is a beneficial bacteria. Uh, that strictly uh, feeds off of mosquito larva and not dragonfly larva. Actually, the mosquitoes feed off of that, uh, mosquito dunks and mosquito bits. It does not uh, impact or uh, kill the dragonfly larva. So these mosquito dunks and mosquito bits and other beneficial bacteria used for that are going to be really good for us to keep um, mosquito infestations down. All right, I'm sorry. For those of you that are um, scared of spiders, I try to pick really cute pictures. Spiders, number one most beneficial insect globally, because there are spiders on every single continent. If we were to gather up all the food that all the insect, uh, all the insects that all the spiders eat throughout their lifespan, equals the weight of 50 million people. That's a lot of food. It's a lot of bugs. That's a lot of insects that are less desirable than spiders, if you ask me. And I want to share that the majority of the spiders are not web weavers. Although come fall, yeah, when we start to see all those spider webs in the garden, those big garden spiders, the reason why they're the iconic, um, uh, you know, insect for Halloween, we have to walk through the garden and kind of like do this so we don't get a web on our face. Most of the spiders in the garden, we don't even see. They're hanging out at the base of plants. They're hanging out at the base of flowers, waiting for their prey to come when they can ambush them, jump on them and eat them. Crab spiders I are my most favorite. I see them all around my garden. I'm so happy to see them. And it's really funny because the minute they see me, they run and hide. So it's not always easy to get a picture. But um, spiders are really our friends and they really want nothing to do with us. So I hope that this will give you a little bit of tolerance to maybe um, like them a little more than, you know, being afraid. Okay, this is weird. Um, this is not something we would ever visually see with our eyes. We'd need a microscope. These are beneficial nematodes. They are uh, microscopic worm-like organisms that naturally live in the soil and they eat a lot of soil dwelling uh, insects. So it's going to be the um, uh, larval form of, you know, of uh, cucumber beetles, of vegetable leaf miners, of uh, they eat flea larva, um, grubs, um, the weevil larva, other beetle larva, cutworms, gosh, oh, cabbage maggots, um, root maggots, gosh, just so many more. I'll, they just consume. There's about three different species that we'll uh, want or we can purchase to inoculate our garden soils with that they could take over, uh, they could take care of a lot of these soil dwelling pest insects. This is a picture of uh, nematodes attacking a fungus gnat larva. So the fungus gnats that are in our house plants or outside great way to uh, eliminate them is to get yourself some nematodes. You can purchase them at Sloat or online. Uh, check it out, but it's really cool. All right, and then we have our bees and other pollinators. So there's over 4,000 species of native bees in North America. We have 1,600-ish in California, and we have about 100 in the Bay Area. So uh, we have our European honeybees, but then we've got a lot of awesome native bees doing incredible work for us. Understand that 30% um, of our native bees are going to, um, they're not, they don't live in hives. They're, you know, not social. They typically live 
um, singly. And, you know, there's 30% are going to live in um, tubes or tunnels or like reeds or like uh, bamboo, you know, they, anything like that. Where, or um, a bee house, if you've ever made a bee house or a bee uh, nesting block, that's where we'll see these friends. And then the other 70% are actually ground dwellers. They will uh, take um, refuge and find their homes in abandoned beetle tunnels uh, and such, and they will live in the soil. So that's why it's so important that if we have a section of the garden that is uncultivated and just kind of natural, we oftentimes will find that the uh, bees, our native bees, will find um, ground nesting spaces there. So how do we invite our beneficial insects? Let's look at flowers. What do these flowers have in common? We can say they have, they're brightly colored, but then we also have some white flowers, but understand white is also a bright color when it comes to the garden. Something else these flowers have in common is that they're actually clusters of tiny flowers. So we might see a single flower that looks like a daisy here. That's the Origeron, the Glardia, the Cosmo, but those just look like single flower cells, or even this aster that's in my screen. But what we're seeing to us is a single flower, but to an insect, those petals are rays and that color attracts them. And then in the middle, that button or that cone in the middle is actually hundreds of tiny, tiny flowers. And that's what's attracting them. As well as alyssum or yarrow or ceanothus, uh, uh, flowers that are in clusters of tinier flowers. And the reason why we want uh, a variety of tiny flowers is because most of the beneficial insects that we've already talked about are tiny. And this, and a lot of the beneficial insects adults are nectar and pollen feeders and not um, going for the protein meal. So flowers that look like daisies or sunflowers such as Origeron, Cosmos, Asters, Echinacea, uh, Helenium, Calendulas are going to be excellent, as well as flowers that grow in clusters of tiny flowers, like that cilantro, the parsley, the dill, the oregano, yarrow, ceanothus. We want to let these, um, I, I love letting my herbs go to flower. In fact, I strictly plant cilantro and parsley just for the flowers because when those are in flower, not only do they make a great cutting flower to bring in with your flowers for a vase, but when you look outside, you'll see so many of our beneficial friends just swarming them. It's really cool. And I will say, plant and they will come and leave, have a tolerance for some pest insects and they will come. So to find a plant list that will help you get started, you know, by attracting beneficial friends, there are some really cool handouts on the Our Water Our World website, which is the Healthy Gardens fact sheet, as well as this 10 most wanted uh, handout. This is going to be really great and I'll have plant lists that will attract beneficials. I know that the UC Master Gardeners, whatever your local chapter is, will have a list of plants that attract beneficials, as well as the California Native Plant Society. Um, and I believe your local garden centers like Sloat, Many of them have lists of plants that attract beneficial insects. So I also included an activity sheet from the Pest and or Pal Activity Guide for Kids. Uh, check it out. There's a whole guide. You can scan uh, these pictures or get the PDFs and print them out or take a screenshot, uh, you can go to ourwaterourworld.org and just search Pester Pal, an activity guide for kids. And you can see this whole fun activity guide for uh, to share with your children or other friends that are kids that you know. And then more garden allies, just to touch on, it's not just the beneficial insects. We've got birds, birds, 90% of them throughout their life are going to feed on insects, even hummingbirds. They're feeding their youngs once they're hatched. Frogs. Uh, this guy was in my tower of string beans. They eat, uh, it's kind of alarming and really fun, but understand that frogs are eating aphids, slugs, snails, and a ton of other insects. 
bats. We've got over 400 species around the Bay Area, and they do a really great job uh, keeping populations of pests down at night. They eat moths and mosquitoes and flying gnats and other insects. And then our lizards, oh my gosh, our Western fence lizard. Did you know that uh, if a tick goes to feast on the lizard's blood, there is a weird enzyme in the lizard that neutralizes Lyme's disease and will then clear that tick from Lyme's disease. It's totally crazy. Uh, a scientist over at UC Berkeley discovered this. We also can find salamanders and snakes. These are all things that might freak us out when we discover them, like picking up a piece of flagstone and one comes crawling out. But these are all really important to, um, for the ecosystems of our gardens. So now let's talk about setting our gardens up for success, how we can attract them and how we can keep them around. So gardening for the good bugs. We're going to plant a variety of flowering trees, shrubs, and perennials. We're going to offer a water source. This could be a bird bath, but I also like to offer water sources for the little ones, like my bees, my hoverflies. And what that looks like is a small glazed saucer. It doesn't have to be big. It could be a four inch saucer. It could be an eight inch saucer, whatever you like. Maybe you've got a large one at home you're not even using anymore. And I will uh, put pebbles in there, like some Mexican pebbles or some gravel. Uh, as long as it's not from the beach, if I've gathered it from the beach, it has a tendency to be too high in salts. So I'll just get the stuff I buy in a little bag at the garden center because I know it's clean. And I will uh, fill water up halfway up the uh, width or the, you know, up the pebbles. And the reason why I have pebbles there is so that the bees and other flying friends, such as butterflies, can land on those pebbles. So those pebbles are a landing pad, and then they can access the water without drowning. And I will uh, refresh that water daily, just like I'm giving fresh water to my pets. I'm giving fresh water to my beneficial insects and the birds. We're also going to let some of the flowers go to seed. I'm not going to deadhead all of them. When I know that my perennials are kind of at the end of their flowering season and I've had many weeks to enjoy them, I'm now going to let them go to seed. And the reason why is because many birds enjoy the seeds and they'll also use um, some of the flower parts as nesting materials, specifically the Japanese anemones and the, um, the clematis. So we see those like kind of uh, whorls of, um, you know, like silk or wool, they'll use that as nesting material. We also want to uh, take advantage of like a chunkier mulch that we can buy either at the garden center or we get from the landscape supply yards. And this is going to provide shelter and nesting places for many of our beneficial insects. And we also want to leave an area of the garden raw and natural and uncultivated without mulch on it for those ground nesting bees. And then we want to reduce and avoid pesticides. So when we use the chemical controls, which are the pesticides, we always want to use them as a last resort. We always want to know the pest and only target that pest and understand that the aphids on the rows are not going to be the same aphids that attack the chard or the kale or the escapulus. So many of the insects that we see, the pest insects, are very host specific. So that helps us also identify what the pest is, is by knowing what the plant is. Not always the case, but it's a starting point. We also want to spot apply. So if we have aphids on our rose, we want to just spray that rose with like an insecticidal soap. And we do not want to spray the entire garden because there might be beneficial insects in other parts keeping the pest insects at bay. We always want to choose eco-friendly and less toxic products. However, eco-friendly and less toxic products will also impair beneficial insects and pollinators if they're present. So just know that once eco-friendly and less toxic products are dry, then there's no impact, there's no residuals that will harm beneficial insects or pollinators or our pets or children. 
We always want to spray at the end of the day. This is at sundown. And the reason why is because we see our pollinators still actively foraging at the end of the day, but pretty much once that sun is down and the day has slightly cooled, that's when we'll see our pollinators, they're done foraging for the day. And that's when we, is the best time of day to apply a pesticide. We're also going to apply that time of day is typically when the breezes have calmed because we don't want to ever spray a pesticide when there's a breeze more than five miles an hour. And we always want to avoid applying a pesticide when trees are in bloom. So when those apple trees are in bloom or the plum trees are in bloom, it's a good rule of thumb to not apply a pesticide because we can harm our beneficial uh, pollinators that are foraging for pollen. And we do want to understand what are the unintended consequences of our actions. And it's really a good thing to understand that we want to try to avoid products that contain neonicotinoids. Uh, the neonics are going to be systemic pesticides. Um, they do work really well and that's why they're so popular. However, they are very harmful for our beneficial insects and our pollinators. Um, they actually are going to also be killed by these products. These are products that work as um, systemic. Uh, they work systemically, meaning they move through the cell structure of the plant and they get through all parts of the plant, including the stamen where, and the pollen. So um, it is just really nice to please avoid using these products. Um, they come as soil drenches and also as ready to use sprays and go for an alternative product if we need to use them. For more information on, uh, on learning about the impact of pesticides for uh, pollinators, uh, the Bee Precaution Pesticide Rating is a really cool resource that's on the UCIPM website. I encourage you to check it out. And then because proper identification is so important, it is really, really necessary because if we can't properly identify the pest, we're not going to be able to properly solve that pest problem. Because we want to understand the life cycle, we want to understand the pest habitat and the timing of that pest, and then we also want to know, are there any natural enemies, are any beneficial insects present? This is going to help us solve these problems. But what I'd like to walk you through are a couple lookalikes, because it's really easy to mistake a good bug for a bad bug and a bad bug for a good bug. So here is our mealybug destroyer that feeds on mealybugs. And here's our flea beetle that feeds on the foliage of seedlings and other leafy greens. They look very similar. Now, typically flea beetles are all black, but not always the case. And they, these two are very similar in size. So it'd be very easy to mistake the good, good bug for the bad bug. Now we have these two. This one I'd say is pretty common. I see them in the garden all the time. This is a pest. This is our cucumber beetle. But then we have this mildew eating ladybug that has very similar coloring. The coloring can either be tan or olive, kind of an olive gray to a tannish. And they feed on mildew spores. Totally crazy. So bad bug versus good bug looking very similar. And then we have our damsel bug that preys on a wide variety of small insect pests. Whereas we have this leaf footed bug that's a pest for tomatoes and pomegranates in some of the warmer areas of California. So that would be the uh, Eastern side of Contra Costa County and along the Central Valley and more North. So that's our good bug, that's our bad bug. So I just wanted to share that it's not always easy um, so we've got some really good resources for you. Of course, we've got the Our Water, Our World website that has that library of fact sheets that you can check out. But we also have the UCI PM website, which is going to help you identify the pests in the certain plants that you have. So if I have a plant such as, um, uh, let's say, rosemary, um, and I don't know if this is a friend or a foe. I'm going to go to the UCIPM website. I'm going to type in rosemary. I'm going to see all the pests 
that rosemary can get or, or prone to here in California. And then I'm going to help by process of elimination, learn what the pest is, learn what the life cycle and the type of damage that pest does, and then compare it to what I'm seeing in the garden. And sometimes what I'm going to see is the beneficial insect present that I thought was the pest making the problem. Because a lot of times we see the problem, we see the evidence of that pest, but we don't necessarily see the pest. Also on the UCIPM website, we have these really cool tools. These are the quick tips for beneficial predators and the range of ladybugs that we'll see around the garden. It's really fun, um, check it out. And then there's this another really great resource, which is the bugguide.net. I understand you can take a picture of the bug in question, email it to them, and they will let you know what it is. And then there's also uh, the National Pesticide Information Center. Now, not only is this a great resource for understanding how pesticides work, so we could look up the active ingredients of the pesticides that we might use and have a better understanding of their impacts, but there's also this quick list of natural enemies. So have a look, it's a really great resource and it's a lot of fun. And so in close, I'd like to share when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. In the universe. Everything is connected. So I hope that the takeaway today, and here is a hoverfly, I told you it was my spirit insect, came and landed on my thumb. So awesome, I just love it. Just understand everything is connected. So in our gardens, we will, um, yeah, we might have some good bugs, we might have some bad bugs, but we won't have the good bugs without the bad bugs. So um, having some tolerance and letting some of the good bugs, you know, do what they got to do is going to attract the, um, it's going to attract the good bugs. And, and then it's fun for us to go outside and discover and hunt and take note. And that makes it even more exciting and more it's more inspiring and more of a reason to reduce the pesticide usage, even the eco-friendlies. So thank you. Let's have your questions. Bugs are so cool. I know, isn't yeah. it fun, Jen? Totally fun. I'm completely geeking out. And I think if I had to choose my favorite, although I love them all, I really like the parasitic wasp because that is, it's like so super rad. Um, anyway. Yeah. Thank you. That was an awesome presentation. I do. Um, we do have some some really good questions. I, I just want to acknowledge I just noticed that 26% of attendees have never attended a webinar of ours before. Wow. And so welcome. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. And um, we're really happy to have you. That's awesome. And if anybody hasn't filled out the poll yet, if you could go and fill out the, the poll. It's, it's valuable information for us and for me, especially I'm trying to figure out the summer webinar schedule and stuff. Um, also to your point about uh, resources on beneficial insects, I did uh, link handouts to the follow-up email that you got um, that SLOAT has that I think is really valuable. So it is a list of plants that attract beneficial insects. And then there's also a recipe recipe for the good bug tub, um, which is super awesome, especially if you have just a small space and you can mm -hmm. only, you know, container garden and stuff, you can create a whole community of plants that attracts beneficial insects in a container. So that's a really good recipe to have. And that link is on your the reminder email that you got an hour before the class um and then i also want to remind you that next week we're having joan pont from the native california native plant society and she will wow. be talking about she's super amazing and she'll be talking about attracting native pollinators and specific plants and what they attract. And so definitely sign up for that 100%. That's gonna be a great sort of extension from what Suzanne's talking about this week. Um, 
And then a lot of people want to follow Suzanne on Instagram. And so I just want to plug, she's got it. I think, is it on there? It's she's plant harmony at plant harmony yeah. on Instagram. So follow, follow her account. Um, really good Thank content. You. And then you can, another resource is you can bring in your sample to the garden center mm -hmm. to slow. Like Suzanne said, we do always encourage you to bring it in a plastic bag because if, you know, if we don't know if it's a good or bad bug, um, you know, it's best to kind of contain it when you're bringing it in and exposing it to a bunch of other plants. So if you can put it in a plastic bag, when you bring in the sample, we can help you identify the bug, hopefully, um, and, and or we also have a garden guru on our website that you can send pictures to, too. And that's amazing. Okay. Um, all right, let's get to more questions. Um, one person asked and just wanted clarification. When you talk about the the buckwheat with the ladybug, is that the eriogonum? Is that the buck, mm -hmm. buckwheat that you're talking about? Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's an awesome plant. Um, it is. It is. And then this is a good question that I've wondered myself is if you have yellow ja jacket traps up around the garden is that also uh are you also also risking attracting beneficial insects no well uh no they the um the yellow jacket traps by rescue by safer there's a number of brands out there they're specific for yellow jackets and it's typically some type of attractant that is um similar to like the picnic food, like the, when we're outside and having a barbecue or a cookout and those yellow jackets start to swarm our plates, it's, that's going to be a similar, um, attractant. So it's really specific for yellow jackets. Um, great. And, uh, are you, do you consider earwigs good or bad bugs? Um, I, not sure what earwigs are good for yet, although every single um, thing that's on this planet is good for something. So it's always, always like to learn. Um, so if someone knows what earwigs might be good for, let me know. Um, but I don't see them as a good bug. I see them as a pest. And um, I really don't like, of all the pests, of all the pests in the garden, earwigs are probably my number one. Um, I just- They're like, a little creepy. Yeah, the way people feel about spiders, I feel the same way about earbuds, uh, earwigs. I, I just thought that they eat decomposing material. I, I don't know. No, they'll get in the flowers. They chew the flowers. They chew yeah. the leaves. They just, they do a lot of damage. So um, yeah, they, and they eat also, I think the organic matter, decomposing our mat, organic matter too, but they'll eat strawberries. I mean, and they're right there with the um, sow bugs or the little pill bugs, the roly polies. They're also in there eating our plants too. So, so what I've heard and what I've done before with those is rolling up a newspaper, sort of like a damp newspaper. Yep. And that'll also get some slugs and stuff. And so basically mm -hmm. you can do that for the, um, the earwigs and the sow bugs and the slugs. And then you can take the whole thing and crumple it up. Yeah, it's gross. Yeah. It's gross, but cool too at the same time. <laughs> um, okay, so. But Jen, just while you're looking for another question, I just really want to clarify that when we're talking about the parasitic wasps compared to yellow jackets, yellow jackets are giants compared to the parasitic wasps. Parasitic wasps are so tiny, we typically don't even recognize them as wasps. And they, you know, when, again, if we let, and I invite everyone just to try this out, get some cilantro, get some parsley, let it go to flower, and you'll see whatever insects are swarming it, it's going to be the hoverflies or the surfeit flies, and it's going to be parasitic wasps. And you're going to look and they're really tiny, like super tiny minuscule. So a lot of times we mistake them as um, maybe fungus gnats when they're actually um, the parasitic wasps. So, and then in comparison to a yellow jacket, yellow jackets are like ginormous compared to them. So just to keep in mind the scale. 
Um, some people are asking about uh, where you can buy ladybugs and Sloat does carry them. We will have them in stock next week. We were, we were hoping to get them by this weekend um, for this kind of prom promo that we're doing and before Suzanne's presentation, but uh, they were pushed back into next week. So we will have them next week and they come in a bag or a carton or whatnot. Um, Suzanne, what are your, what's your method for releasing ladybugs and sort of keeping them around if you, you know, if you don't have the, the buckwheat or, you know, do you have like a certain procedure? Yeah. That so whenever, okay, there's a couple of things. First of all, we want to make sure we've got uh, flowers that are going to offer a food source for them. So if you don't, if you're not sure if you've got the right combination of flowers or if you're a little worried or, you know, or if you're just trying to introduce more flowers, a really easy thing to do is just get a six pack of Alyssum or Cosmos or um, uh, anything that's going to look like a daisy, you know, that or like clusters of little flowers. But Alyssum is typically always in flower at the garden center and it's very easy and it's abundant. So I usually always pick up a six pack of Alyssum, one or two six packs. I get my ladybugs. I make sure that they are going to stay cool. So I might buy them at the garden center or when I buy them at the garden center, I'm going to make sure I'm going straight home. I'm going to pretend it's like ice cream because you know I they're in the car too long. They can get too hot and um, I could just not be very happy for them. So then when we get home, we're going to put them straight in the fridge. I know that might seem weird. If you're freaked out, put them in a paper bag and then in the fridge. <laughs> and then after the sun has gone down, uh, if we also want to make sure we've got food for them to eat. So we want to make sure we've got aphids. And, it, and if we're, you know, even wanting to ensure that they stick around a little longer, we can spray the plants that also have aphids with a little bit of that sugar water that I mentioned before. It's one tablespoon of sugar to one cup of water. Just, you can mix it in a watering can or a spray bottle. And then at night, um, and we've also slightly watered the area. So there's a little bit of water droplets around because they're going to be thirsty. We take that container, we put it under the plant or next to the plant that has aphids and we just take the lid off. We do not need to sprinkle them out. I made this mistake once. And then what also came out was all the shavings. Then I had shavings, which could be a good thing or not, but it aesthetically was not the right thing to do for this particular situation. Those ladybugs are going to slowly start to wake up because they've been in their refrigerated hibernation and they're gonna to start to creep out looking for water and food because they're thirsty and hungry. So that's why it's very important that we make sure there's enough, there's a plant with aphids. Now, um, because ladybugs can feed off of hundreds, okay, hundreds, it might seem like we've got hundreds of aphids, but oftentimes the infestations are not as crazy as, um, I let them get. So um, let the ladybugs are gonna feed, but a lot of them are gonna fly away looking for food because there's just not enough food for them. But the good news is, is that during this time of them sticking around, they're going to lay eggs. And then those eggs are gonna hatch and we're gonna have larvae. And pretty much if we just are in the habit of um, letting nature take its course and we are, um, less likely to go for the pesticide, or we're really only using those eco-friendly pesticides extremely selectively, we have a tendency to keep this uh, life cycle uh, in our garden. And you know, when we've got habitat and a variety of flowering things, we have a tendency to have ladybugs sticking around year after year. Yeah, and I have, so the ladybugs typically come in like, um, like the shavings that you put in like a guinea pig cage or something, right? It's like little wood. Yeah, like eco flakes. Eco, okay. So I have, um, I have taken those sometimes and like just put a, a little patch of them in sort of like, like the crotch of the plant because I don't know if this is true, but it, it kind of made sense to me that that's like their bed and they'll go back and yeah. like find it and sleep. You know what I yeah, mean? I it's, yeah. It's going to be nesting material for them. It's nesting so. 
material. And so I kind of liked that thought. And so I, I will like, you know, I'll sort of, like Suzanne said, either it's, you know, it's a cup. So like you can take off the cup and there'll be uh, bugs on the, t on the cap and then bugs on the, in the cup. And you can set the cap in one place and set the base in one place and then take some shavings up and, and whatnot. So um, yeah, they're amazing in the garden. I, I release them every year. Uh, when we were talking before about sow bugs, that's the same thing as the roly police. So that's the same thing that when you touch them, they roll up in a ball. Um, okay, so spiders, when you were talking about spiders, are they, I mean, they're good no matter what, are they good around citrus trees and fruit trees and things like that? Yes. Yep. I mean, the only time spiders aren't good is when they're in your house. Like, so I don't like spiders in my house. So I'll, you know, sweep them up and get them outside. Although when they're in the house, I know they're eating less desirable things. So I have a little bit of a tolerance, but I don't like them in the house, but outside they are, um, yeah, they are extremely important. Now there are of course some spiders like black widows that we wanna stay away from because they can um, injure us. But for the most part, most spiders have, they don't want anything to do with humans and they are not going to harm us. Is there anything that eats uh, white flies or spider mites? Yeah, that's going to be our uh, ladybug larva, our lacewing larva. What else was there? There was a couple. Um, the um, mealy bugs, uh, the mealy bug destroyer, destroyer, destroyer will eat some soft scale and, um, and spider mites, and I believe the white fly nymphs. And uh, of course, spiders are going to eat all of those. So um, that's, yeah. The mealy bug destroyers definitely eat aphid scale mites, thrips, and white fly nymphs. I didn't know about the mealy bug destroyers uh, before. So I'm I know it's fun. Those. And I, I do realize, you know, a couple people and, and myself included are nervous about, yeah, there, mm -hmm. there is those lookalikes and it's really hard to tell. Um, so that's why the UCI PAM website is so great for us to utilize um, because it's going to help us. So again, remember or understand that pests, most pests are very specific to um, the plant that they want to feed off of. So, um, you know, they have their favorites. Not all of them do like cucumber beetles are going to be out kind of just being a pest for almost everything. However, aphids, um, you know, there are certain colors of aphids and they like certain plants or, um, flea beetles are really going to just go for certain plants or, or type, you know, like, uh, portions of plants, like the leafy greens, not always the fruits. So if we can have an understanding of what the pests are doing and their life cycle, uh, it's going to help us identify who they are and how to manage them. And then it helps us look a little closer at, oh, maybe that was the lookalike. But none of those lookalikes are going to be next to each other or highly unlikely that they would ever be next oh, to each other. So point. it's just to understand, to have a little bit more of a tolerance and a curiosity before we go for the spray. Um, and would you say, I mean, I always tell this story. I have a, a relative that has about 10 fruit trees and 25 roses in their garden. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those, those two are probably the most heavily sprayed mm -hmm. uh, sort of plant genres in the garden and converted his garden into all organic mm -hmm. several years ago. And there was a couple years of transition. Mm -hmm. What ended up happening is, is the, the, gar the bugs sort of balance themselves out. The communities sort of balance themselves mm -hmm. out. And I think that to me, that was the greatest sort of vote for, you know, organic gardening and 
to not be quick to spray because those two are so heavily sprayed, mm -hmm. you know, nature just in its own way is a perfect system and balances out if we sort of let it do its thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So remember, we're all of those other things we've learned so far in the other webinars. It's like increasing the health of the soil, making sure the plant, the root system's healthy. We're watering properly. The plant is going to be more resilient. And then we're going to have a tolerance of some uh, pest insects. And then the good bugs are going to come and keep that balance. I mean, I've taken care of so many rose estates for clients without using pesticides. And they're like, how are you able to do that? And it's by increasing the health of the soil and working with that alfalfa meal, working with the earthworm castings, because those have those beneficial enzymes that act as repellents or make the plants more resilient. Uh, one last question. Um, and oh, I do want to remind you all that we are available. We really want to make sure that we, if we didn't address your questions, feel free to email either Suzanne or myself. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're here to support um, and encourage your journey, your garden journey. Um, one last question is uh, using ne grub nematodes in raised vegetable beds. Is there any issue with that or no? No, the nematodes are not harmful at all. I mean, the beneficial nematodes, there are harmful nematodes, but the beneficial nematodes, we are going to inoculate the soils when there is food for them to eat. So the grubs need to be present. And then, um, yeah, and that's all they're going to do is just eat soil dwelling uh, insect pests. So that's their job. Yeah. And side note, that's like, if you have a lawn or something with raccoons that are rolling up the lawn, they, they are going for the grubs and the nematodes are what eat the grubs. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good uh, beneficial uh, insect to introduce. Yeah, also moles. If moles are tunneling in your lawn and you, don't, you wanna get rid of the moles, we'll get rid of the food source. And we do that by inoculating that area with beneficial nematodes, which will re remove the food source. It'll remove all those grubs that the moles are going for. That's great. Well, this has been super informative. As always, I learn so much from your presentations. And, you know, again, what I what I like most about your presentations is I feel like they're super accessible to beginner gardeners as well as advanced. And I think we all end up learning a ton. Um, so thank you so much, Suzanne. And just a reminder, the recording will be available on Tuesday, April 20th. And that's a good chance to if you want to sort of review some of the things that she presented and go back and rewind and screenshot and whatnot uh, feel free to do that thank you everyone it's a beautiful saturday so go out and enjoy the sun enjoy your garden look for beneficial insects <laughs> plant plants that'll encourage them and you know have fun with it so thanks so much thank you suzanne thanks have everyone have a great day thanks jen it was fun